My name is uh, Dr. Henry Lustiger Thaler, and we're here today with Mr. Mayor David Glickman Rubin. And this is an interview, uh, a testimony interview, for uh, being created for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Kleiman Holocaust Education Center in Brooklyn, New York. Mr. Glickman, um, if you could tell me your place of birth. My place of birth is Kanchin, Poland. And the date of your uh, the, birth? Uh, 1926. Thank you. Tell me some of your early memories in Kanchin and Sosnova. Just take me to that uh, early about When we, my father became Roman Sosnovich in 19... 30, that's when he moved to Sosnovich from Hanchin. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my early memories of Sosnovich. Uh, when I okay, uh, got a little older, I went to Haida there, and uh, then, uh, uh, first, no, first I had a rabbi in the house. With our, uh, the gabai of our, we had a shul in our house, down the minion every day, and also on Shabbat. And the gabai of the shul, he was my rabbi to teach me alibis in every, and, uh, and later on, when I started learning Chumash, I went to the yeshiva. Of it's called, it was called Darke Noam. Yeshiva for younger boys, and uh, later on in Sosnovitz. In Sosnovitz. Mm -hmm. Later on, we got a little older, and the yeshiva of Yisoda Atara, which was. Like a very orthodox Haida, and uh, you know, I learned there uh, almost all the years uh, until till 1939. Mm -hmm. In 1939, and as we know, the war broke out. Before we go there, tell me a little bit about your family and your, my family. your grandparents, <clears throat> your parents. Uh, my, my grandfather, uh, Bitsigal Glickman, Reuben, married a daughter of the Walbaromer Rabbi. Hmm. The Walbaromer Rabbi, the Walbaromer Rabbi is, was a grandson of the uh, uh, we can come back to it. We can yeah. come back to that. It'll, it will come to you. Uh, okay. No, so, you can continue yeah, with your family. So, and in my grandfather, uh -huh. Rabitzigal Glickman Rubin was from Galicia, from Joker of Galicia. So when he married his wife, from the Volbaram Rabbi, Volbaram was under, under Russia mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at that time. Mm. Before the First World War, Volbaram was under Russia. So in the Sosnovich, in the early 90s, or late 1800s, it started becoming a big city, and they were looking for a roof. And a lot of people from Walbom, Olkush, Dombarov, the whole area of Zaglembia, moved into Sosnovich because it was 
near the German border before, you know, people have started to do business with Germany, Jews, a lot of Jews and also. So they wanted my grandfather to become to be Rove in Sosnovitz. Mm -hmm. So it being that he was from Galicia, which was Austria, and this was Russia, he couldn't become Rove legally because he was a foreigner for, from a, a different country. Mm -hmm. So he had to change the name, and the name became Glickman. Mm. That's why the name is, is Glickman. And, but the original is Reuben. So the, when he became Reuben Sosnovitz, and, uh, <coughs> and we, I was still, we were still in Hanchin. I was born in Hanchin near the Celts. So at that point, uh, my, we, we lived in Hanchin. And in 1930, my grandfather was Nifta, you know, passed away. So my father took up the position as a, the oldest son of my grandfather, he took up the position in Sosnovitz. He became a rule at that time. That's when I was a, a few years old. So, but that's when we moved to Sosnovitz. And when Sosnovitz started, you know, they had a, 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 the gabai that was in our, we had our minion in our house. And the rabbi was my t teacher, so it was great. And he used to tell me stories about the Bajshemtov, which youth are, his grandson's youth are, is coming up this week, Yad Kislev. Yad Kislev. This is his grandson. Mesh Bajshem Rabbi is going to be. Uh, this week, the Yota. What were uh, some of the stories that he told you about Russian uh, Yes, Do you remember? Uh, the story. You, uh, you, uh, you like to hear a story sure. about the major day. He told me that the Belshentov used to travel a lot. He used to go from town to town. He always had a minion. And he also knew the Belshentov that this. A man that lives in this town has, has to become poor. It was a, a, he had a bar. He used to sell uh, schnapps for the uh, for the farmers there. But in his vision, he saw that this man that lives in this town that he used to go to before. He has to become poor. He wanted to hurry up the process of him becoming poor in order to come when he comes, he should be rich again. So how did he do? He went with his, <coughs> he went with his uh, uh, his minion that he had to this place, to this town, and he stayed by this, by what they called the, what they called the uh, bar inhabitant, what is it called, the, the owner mm -hmm. of this, that had this bar. And he, uh, so he started to drink it, and uh, you know, with, not to drink, I wouldn't say drink, they, Celebrated the minion, so people, you know, he had to feed him. Mm -hmm. So he became very poor, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the one of the uh, the, uh, the farmer came in, and he said, he said, give me a drink. I, I, he didn't have any more. So, but the. the uh, what is it called? It, that leftover under, uh, under in the barrel from the right. snobs. 
uh, what is that uh, heavy, what is it called, the haven? What, uh, like a syrup, uh, I guess. Huh? A, a syrup or something at the yeah, bottom of the yeah, barrel, well, right? So he, took, so he gave him that drink, and he said, oh, they, they, they all said that. The farmer said, you know what, I'm very old already. I'm going to pass on, you know, I'll tell you a secret. I have a hidden treasure, some things in this, in this forest, that, that, and that, this and that point. Please, I want you to have it. And, and he, the story goes that he passed away, and the man went to this forest and they found the uh, treasure of piece, pieces of gold or whatever, and uh, and they, that's how he became rich again. That's uh, one of the stories that my story. <laughs> my rabbi, the rabbi told me about the Blashemtov. Nice story. Mm. Nice story. Yeah. Tell me about your brothers and sisters. Well, uh, uh, we were actually uh, the family. As a matter of fact, I have a brother living here uh, in Boropag, an older brother. Mm -hmm. He lives here. We are two, uh, two survivors of. Uh, Family of five, we had, uh, but the uh, two kids uh, passed on before that. Uh, young, uh, I had a brother, a younger brother, was uh, was a beautiful young boy, and we had a a, a balcony. On the balcony, we had a closet, and to keep food cold instead. They didn't have refrigeration so much at that time, you know. And he walked out on the closet, and uh, I mean on the balcony there, and the closet fell on him. And passed on it for five years old. Mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, that's the one. And the other, and I had the, the older sister. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, it was, uh, her name was, three names, Reitze, Zelda, Tamar. Reitze, Zelda, Tamar. Yeah. Nice names. She was the oldest. And then came my brother, who uh, lives in Borough Park, right. Josef Borach-Klickmann, and he is named, and, and he was born on the date of the, the, the Gitteyid. The Gitteyid was in the Abiyasibur, uh, from Neistut, Neistut is in Poland, mm -hmm. near, near Kelts, mm -hmm. the, the son of the Moor of Shemesh. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Moor of Shemesh, if you have uh, ever heard of the Moor of Shemesh. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He was the son of the Moor of Shemesh. That was my grandfather's grandfather. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was brought up by the by the Gitteyid. Mm -hmm. The Gitteyid they tell the story that the sons of Rebbe came to Naishtu to the Gitteyid to visit. And the rabbis, the one Rebbe used to all the all Tamidim from the Chose. By the way, uh, my mother is a direct Grand, great, great granddaughter of the house of the name. It's remarkable, Yichas. Uh, it's just remarkable. Uh, yeah, so uh, they say a story that the Gitte was a Tillim Yid. It said Tillim all the time. And the sons of Ruf came to Naish to, to the Gitte Yid to visit. So the sons of Ruf said to him, you know, I just finished Shas. You know, so the Gitti said to him, I just finished Tillim. 
So he said, you want to change, maybe? The son said, oh. So I, he said, no, I'm not changing my tillet. This is my tillet. You are Shasky. That's, uh, you know, one of the stories in that. <clears throat> anyway, so we'll back to Sosnovitz now. Your, your sister, uh, did she survive the war? No, she was the last one in the, in the ghetto. She was held, uh, maybe 400 people in the ghetto. This poor shoulder, I have a, uh, there's a copy of the, the shoulder of the ghetto. Sosnovitz, near Sosnovitz. Bendin had near, it was not far. Bendin ghetto was close to the Sosnovitz ghetto, ghetto. So she was the last one, so 400 people to send to Auschwitz. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, <coughs> when I. Well, How old was she when she was uh, murdered? Oh, she was married already, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, her husband was uh, Rosenfeld, Asanza Eniko, Asanza Rebbe's great, great, great grandson, mm -hmm. and he was a gem of a person. He, I, well, he, people told me that he was the Davin walking, marching, Young Rosh Hashanah, from his mind, didn't have to have a a master. city. They didn't have. And by the way, I I saw him in Buchenwald, but I did not identify myself to him because I was and I had a band that I'm a Polak, that I'm not Jewish. At this point, they were, and I knew that the marching people in from this camp, concentration camp where he was, you know, and so I was helping, you know, like uh, making go straight, go straight. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, other boy recognized me from a, a friend of mine, my age. Said Maya. So the, the the couples heard that I'm Jewish. They pushed me in with the, with these people together, but I got out of it. And, and, and it, uh, I was still, you know, uh, so. Uh, but he, he did not. So it, uh, they telling me that he was a parent son. Right, a day after the war, or something like this, mm -hmm. my brother and I. So he's, uh... Let's go back to Sosnovet. Yeah, sure. Let's go back to Sosnovet and uh, tell me more about your uh, your life there. We were we were talking about your your parents, your 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 sister, your your brother. Yeah, my my, my sister. She went to you know by the Sarkov and Sosnovet, and she was. Uh, uh, mostly uh, home helping her mother and uh, doing uh, certain things for her father and uh, so and, uh, and, uh, and I went to Haida. My, my brother, older brother, who lives in Borough Park. He went, he was sent away to Krakow to learn in the yeshiva. Mm -hmm. And he learned there by... Do you remember uh, which yeshiva that was? Uh, yeah, he learned in the Belza, Belza yeshiva. We are descendants, Belza Heineke. I'm a Belza Heineke, you know, well, the first Belza Rebbe. Descendant from there. And, he went, and then he, uh, he learned by... Uh, by about Rab Shimel Zelochava, which was a big gun, you know, in 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 Krakow, Rab Shimel Zelochava, and he was. As a matter of fact, he tells me that the 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 war when the war broke out, 
and he was in Kharkov, and we, and we were home, or we, we weren't home, we were, we were, I'll get back to that. So he asked him, well, what should I do? Well, should I go home? Should, I don't know where they are, if they're alive or not alive. He said, he said to him, Rabbi Shimon Zelichov, and said to him, don't worry, they're all alive. And if you stay with me a little longer, and then when things calm down, you go home. And we, uh, uh, should I go back to the war? When the war broke out, we started, the first of it was not far from the German border, cut of it, you know, so. We knew the Germans were going to come in any minute. Not, it didn't take long. So we started to walk to Olkush, where my grandfather lived, on the Chinchina Reb. So when we went walk, we were walking uh, day and night until we got there. It's about, uh, what I say, uh, I don't know exactly, but maybe 80 kilometers or more, maybe, uh, probably something like this. Because we've got Sosnowitz, Bendin, Domborowitz, Czerlach, Olkus. So the three four cities, uh, you know, we were, we were walking. As we were walking, and the Polish people also running away. So what did they say? And uh, planes are flying on top of German plane. He said, Hitler is coming. Look, Hitler is coming. He's going to kill you. That's what they screamed at us. They were running away for their lives. And here they're telling us, you know, something is it's very, this is, uh, and the uh, Antis seemed like they were so inhabited in them that they didn't care for themselves. They only cared that Hitler was going to kill the Jews. You know, so we, we, we walked to Alkos, so we stayed there, you know, till that was like uh, 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 September. Eleventh, I think, is you know, before Rosh Hashanah, we stayed there until after Sukkot. Meanwhile, people, you know, when they stayed in Norkush, you know, the Germans, when they came and they were there, so used to, so the goyim, masa does the masa. They said to live the big rabbina. They must have a lot of money. So they used to come in with the revolvers drawn like this. And they used to, where, and they asked, where is, where is the rabbina? She was upstairs. It was, uh, uh, my grandfather was almost uh, close to Titian at that point, uh, 87. And he was sitting and learning. But my father spoke German. Why? How could he spoke German? Because he was a draft dodger. He had to run away from Poland. He was in Belgium and in Germany. He had a, he had a cousin in, Germany, in Berlin. So he spoke a little German. So they, he said, to the two uh, Nazis and German officers, please don't go up. That is an old man. If you see him with the revolvers, you know, you, you'll scare him. Something could happen to him. So, but they didn't care. They ran out. I was there myself at that point. They ran up. But they opened it for fried out in the door because the Gabi was sitting in the front, front room. They fried out the door. They saw my grandfather. They 
got a link that said, one time they said, oh, this is a holy man. This one, they didn't get into the rundown. Second time, a different Germans, because the Polacks, at this time, you so you say, oh, you know, Rabbi had money, Rabbi had money. So, came in, and uh, again, they wanted to run out. Where's the Rabbi now? So, they ran up. So, my grandfather was not the shocks, as they say. He said to them, can I give you a drink? So they had this, they, they, you know, they didn't do anything harsh to them, they, you know, they were left. At this point, my brother asked him later, well, well, how come you, you're so calm? So he said, I have, ich darf meure hum that was the uh, And then uh, when we say that in all Kurdish until after Sukkot, after Sukkot we came home, back to Sosnovitz, uh, you know, things. Meanwhile, we heard that they, what did they do in Sosnovitz? They did. They took a, uh, uh, how many boys, boys, uh, young teenagers, a little older, you may be, uh, they, and they, they are hungered from the rich families, both the two families, the Germans. We were not home at this point, but we heard. I took a couple of teenagers, and, uh, uh, you know, and, <clears throat> and, then, and then life got a little better. They hung the teenagers? Uh, yeah, they hung these the, uh, the teenagers, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 later on, so at this uh, that was uh, uh, 1940, uh, middle of 40. Uh, then there was this, uh, uh, what should I say, the Gemeindefeer, the Manik Marnik Marin. You heard, did you hear of Marnik Marin? No, I didn't. No? Mm -hmm. Marnik is a name. Mm -hmm. Marnik Marin. Mm -hmm. Marion. Marin. This Monique Marine became the, what is it called, the, the community leader, what is it called, the, 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 the head of the, the, head of the, the Jewish committee. Right. In Sosnovitz. In Sosnovitz, in the halls of Glambia. Mm. And he was a sharp man, very bright. You know, man, but uh, all, uh, and he could do whatever he wanted. But you know, the German gave him, but this was a say, come out the absolutely, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, authority. Huh? The, the authority to that's make decisions the option, yeah, that's the right regarding one. the Jewish community. Yeah, yeah. The, and they have authority for the whole the Glambia and this and that. And he, he was running the place. And meanwhile, this is the, the 1940. So the city was a little calm at that point, at the beginning of the 40. Which, uh, as a matter of fact, then my, we, the, the, the mikveh, we went to the mikveh, and the, the mikveh was, on the corner of the mikveh was the police station. Police station. So the Germans was the, occupied the police station. And we had to go through the, 
At that point, the, the, the police was stationed and they saw my father and me and my brother, my older brother, going to the mix. Oh, they slept us in. Slept us in, pulled us in, said, ah, who are you going to do? He is a jewel, and we were trying to cut his beard off. My father spoke German because he was a draft dodger, as I said before, he was in Germany. So he said, Ach, oh, this, this, this is nice, such nice people that wouldn't do a thing like that, and this and that. And they, yeah, they didn't care. They didn't, they, you know, meanwhile, there came a call. Somebody had called to this guy, Monique Marine. Then they took, and he right away called the police station to let my father out. I mean, because he had respect very, he not, was not religious, he was a, uh, you know, uh, how do you call it, a modern person. Not the legend at all, but he had respect for my father. So at this point, they let him out, and they didn't touch his beard. And then, then later on, things got a little harsher. Because, uh, so we didn't have, uh, you know, uh, some the food is concerned about it. This and this. But I still, I still went to Yeshiva at that time. Yeshiva, so you're a Torah. And then in 1941, 41, they started to take people out. And then 41, maybe the end of 41. I think we call the exact date. As a matter of fact, we had uh, a man that used to come up to us, an older person, older person that he, he was my grandfather's age, a little older than him. And he said, I, I, <laughs> what can I say? I, they, they, they took him away, uh, and I escorted him to the train station. We didn't know, we didn't believe that there's uh, a place like Auschwitz. But uh, on the other hand, I had a, a friend, my uncle's brother, a younger brother, it came in 1940, then the 41, yeah, it was at the same time. I, I, he was, he was, they caught, caught him with another group of people and they went to work, you know, they pulled him away to work someplace and they told me I saw girls. There were shaven heads. This was Auschwitz already, Birkenau. Who heard of Didn't believe him. They come out, but didn't believe him. Yet, you know, so. And then, you know, and then it started to. Um, and then came 1942, was the big, I mean, they, at the beginning, they took all the people. This Monic Marine, I think he knew what's going on. He knew that was the Auschwitz, but he didn't reveal, I think. But on, on the other hand, he tried to save young people. Like, how, how did he? Huh? How did he, he send do us that? The labor How camp. Do you understand he sent us to the labor camp. Mm. He took, uh, they started to take young people to the Jewish militia. 
So he knew everybody almost, you know, so it wasn't such a, whatever you know, it's a, a thousand, thousand, thirty thousand Jewish people living in South Africa. But he was uh, known, so he, and he, he started to, to hop, I mean, in the middle of the day, young people send him to labor camps. As a matter of fact, I, and my brother, I said, we were afraid. My father said, don't sleep home, because they, they're going to get you. So I slept by an uncle. And my brother slept by a different uncle. But they knew. They knew all of my family. So in the middle of the night, they grabbed us. That was 1942. Yeah. Uh, they are late on the was already, yeah. And they uh, pulled us into the, uh, they, had, well, they had in Sosnovitz a special house where they keep the uh, captives. Okay, I'll go back to that. Now, first, I'll go back to 1942, was the big punk plots they have. They get night in the They grabbed all the Jewish people. They announced that every Jew, uh, children, everybody was, has to go to the football field. They want to change the documents. And it was an excuse, of course. We got to the football field. It was an era of Ellen, 1942. And we got there. So, I got to go home, as they say, to start. And I, went, I wasn't sure. So I was not the you know, so kids, and my brothers, the younger brother, my sister, the youngest. We were in West Germany. Got that cold, started to pour. <laughs> so that's, that's again, not a joke. to pour. We stayed there on this, all the youth that we were probably, I would say, uh, maybe 25, 30,000 Jews, or maybe more. Good. And uh, so uh, and it stayed there all night. And the next morning, they, uh, they brought in the uh, tables and the Germans with the hand dogs, with the big dogs. And, this, and everyone had to go through that selection of this. And when they go home or when they go uh, you know, they will have to send you away. Because, uh, we, uh, <coughs> we stayed there all night, and the uh, next morning they started selection, and we, so until our, uh, uh, our, <coughs> our time came to, to approach the table with the English and Germans, and I, my brother, and I had a document that we work in Katowice for the Germans. So, okay, it's a house of love. They said, go home. And my mother started to cry to her father. And they said, you know, what's going to be with the and mayor? What's going to be with them? At this point, my father had a premonition after her to say, don't worry, we're leaving, we're leaving over two cottage sugars for us. My father had a premonition that this is it. You know, at the beginning of the war, he, he absolutely knew that this is coming to an end. And so, we went out, and they were saying they were sent. They emptied 
houses in Sosnovitz, all the people, because there were so many people, they couldn't send them away all in one day, in one shot. I mean, so they put them in these empty houses. My parents, my brothers and sisters were put in the houses. I, I and my brother were out. And they were put in this house. And I remember when we went there to see them, because they couldn't they give me one of the hundred windows on the little town. And at that point, the Marine, Marine had the power <coughs> to, <coughs> to take people out. So I took my parents out. Because he had very much respect for my father as a wolf. And other, my uncle also, a wolf and outs, an old source of it. He took them out also. And other people were still taken back home. So a lot of people, that, of course, it was, uh, he had. Uh, uh, what do you say? He had a certain uh, certain quality in him that gave him, you know, that the Germans had a little respect for him. So, so well, still, they were still home, they were sent home, and I was, we were home, and then. And uh, you know, life was, of course, miserable at that time. It's, uh, it, uh, it's a matter of fact, at that point, my grandfather, Gina uh, Rebbe, uh, was in our house. He didn't go to that point. Megan, this ma 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 Monic Marine, this, she, this picture. You show the pictures a little bit. No, later. this picture is important. Oh, excuse me. Um, oh, but, uh, sorry. Uh, you're ah, disconnected. Yeah. You're connected. I'm we'll, sorry. we'll show the picture yeah, a little no, bit later. On, the but picture. We'll come back to it. Yeah, the picture that see on the see on the left. Uh, uh -huh. My old the old man. That picture was taken at that point mm. from the when the when we had to go to uh, to the football field to. In other words, to change the documentaries. Mm -hmm. So the, this Monic Marine sent out a, a, a photographer to take a picture of my grandfather because he, he, he didn't go. He arranged it, though so that picture has a Judah in this. But he didn't go. So. And, uh, you know, so we went at this point. We, so there's the letter sound. My father said to my mother, Don't worry, we love, we leave, we're leaving over two curry sugars for us. So, uh, as I said, but they were sent to <coughs> the, uh, the different to the uh, building when they. <coughs> And then it got out, and the, you know, because the, as I said, they couldn't send all the people, uh, so many thousands of people were away in one day, so that uh, the empty buildings, so one of the buildings, my, my parents, my brother, and my sister, younger brother, and, and the sister, and two, uh, two sisters. Uh, so, <coughs> so this Monic Marine, Took them out, mm -hmm. well, you know. Took it. And all that, a few thousand people more, maybe, you know. A lot of, you know, because uh, that point film must have been uh, maybe 30,000 people in South So when, when, uh, when when the Marine went and took them out, he took yeah. them and they were able to go back home? Or yes. They were able to go back yeah, home? Yeah, right. They went back home, mm -hmm. and they were still home until they, you know, they went back home. And we, went, we were home, of course, because mm -hmm. we were on. But, uh, you know, 
a promise to my mother from my father that we will survive at that point. Yeah. Now I tell you something, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I, my brother was thrown to the, with the dead already. And he's in Borough Park now. You know, he was thrown into the dead people in the, in the concentration camp. And more of them, yes, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. And I as well, I, I was left for dead in Bochenbank. We'll come, we'll come to Bochenbank. Yeah, Bochenbach. right, right. Yeah. Just, I'm, I'm, as we're speaking yeah. about Sosnova, at that time you were restricted <coughs> to Sosnova, you couldn't travel around or could no, you? No, could you? Could you? <coughs> I could. Not only on travel, oh, thank you. Not only couldn't travel, couldn't go out there any place. We were just staying home, you know, until, you know, maybe, do whatever you could. You didn't, uh, life was. Uh, I mean, I come out impossible here because. So everything uh, at this point stopped. What? Everything stopped at this point. Everything, you were, yeah. Uh, you, were, you were staying stopped, off the streets. You know, yeah. You live, and every day they used to take uh, five, five, six uh, thousand people and send them away. We didn't know where they send them. We didn't know, we didn't believe. They sent them to Auschwitz. Then started the, you know, the beginning of 42. That's... The, the sense in Sosnova at the time... Yeah. Thousands of people were being sent away. Yeah. And what was the sense, the sense that they were being sent away to their death? Was that, was that, you didn't, you said it was a disbelief, you couldn't believe it. But, or did you think they were being resettled? What was the feeling in the, in the, in, in Sosnova? Some people uh, said that uh, maybe, uh, people believed that it's impossible another human being would do that to other people, uh, you know, to, you know, you know, they didn't believe. Yeah, maybe they thought maybe they were being sent away to resettle, like you say, to other places. Because no one could have believed that such a thing as Auschwitz would burn people to death. Didn't believe. My father believed. My father believed. He said. He he, uh, he said. This is. The end. But uh, so as I said, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and uh, then uh, came uh, uh, that was in 1942. When it was so shallow when we got out, and, and they, uh, and they, um, other people, uh, maybe 25,000 thousand people, they put in different. Houses and stay empty houses, and from there every day they send away five thousand other people. To, you know, I, in this, I think this morning Marine he knew, mm. he knew, he knew. Mm. And, uh, but, so I say he did. So <clears throat> I as I said I was uh, sleeping by my uh, uncle. And my brother said, a different uncle, and they know the family, so they grabbed us in the middle of the night in 1980. That was 1943 uh, already, in the beginning. Uh, and I, yeah. And, uh, and they took us there, and I am there. I mean, at that point, they already sent people with the Auschwitz, uh, Sussman, which became. Uh, a small town already because people were sent away already, you know. So 
Sosnovo was a large, which was, was a yeah. large, a large yeah. city. So, so we had a hundred thousand mm -hmm. inhabitants. Do you remember? I know it's a difficult, a difficult question, but would you remember? Of your time in Sosnova as a young man, what percentage of Sosnova was Orthodox Judaism? Well, I can tell you one thing I saw in the Sosnova book that they had 40 Buddha Medrushim. Hmm. So when they had their own Kupat Cholim, as they say, their own hospital. Jewish, uh, Jewish people, and uh, uh, a lot of what are they called? Uh, you no know, uh, services. Uh, uh, services uh, for Jewish people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a big, nice modern city, and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was. Well, uh, 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 Minunim from, uh, from uh, 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 a Daichi Shul, they had a, a, a Daichi Shul. I remember where it was exactly, the Daichi Shul, because our kids, you want to see, they were the Hamburgs, the Shabbat's davening. Mm. You know, the way the top hats. You know, so I want to, sometimes as a kid, when we walk there to see how they davened there. So they had, and they had the uh, Hasidim, they had the uh, modern, they had the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Zionist, Mizrahi, Agoda, they had the. Uh, uh, also, uh, 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 communists, like uh, what do you call it? They had the name so for socialists, uh, huh? socialist groups, communist so, groups, yeah, Jewish socialists. Socialist, yeah. Bundist, they used mm, to call mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. well, right, of course, of course. Yeah, Bundist, they had it, you know. It uh, well, was the full, uh, the full kaleidoscope of Jewish life. Yeah, that's, uh, full that's right. Yeah, and, and uh, a few big shows, and it's also, it's a big show. The big show was when the, uh, the, uh, the, the Kertag Street, mm -hmm. that was the big show. And, <clears throat> and they had, uh, they had uh, Rabunim, uh, Rav, Rav Stark, Rav Hager. You know, uh, and my uncle, Rab Halberstam, my father, of course, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, a lot of women, and a lot of uh, well-to-do people that uh, mentioned, Groch uh, I mentioned, I can mention the, the what's called, uh, Abramchiks, yeah, the Abramchik. Mm -hmm. They live here, they have sons here, they have grandsons. They live here, well to do here. And of course, the Radomsky Rabbi. Mm -hmm. He lived in Sussex. He was the richest man in Poland. <laughs> you never know him about it. He was the richest man. He, he had a yeah, as a matter of fact, he had a, they say he had a, there was a Rabinestrasse in Berlin. That's what they say. So this was his building. His building. A building that had overcome what he had a, a, mirror, a mirror factory, they say. I don't know if I should bring this up. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I have no, I don't know, maybe. Uh. So we were speaking about um, the deportations, and we're now in 1942, the deportations in Sosnova. Do you want to continue as the, with, with that period in 42, when the deportations were taking place? We, yeah. were, we were speaking about that just yeah. a few moments ago. Shall we return to that? Yeah. Yeah, we, okay, yeah. Well, but perhaps, you, uh, if you like, what we can do 
is we can begin our next segment with yeah. uh, talking about that period of time in 42 with the oh, deportation. Yeah, so we'll yeah. come back. We'll take a little break right now. Okay. We'll take a 10-minute break, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back to speak okay. some more. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. And then I can break. Maybe it's better. Okay, good. We're back with yeah. um, Mr. Mr. Glickman, and yeah. in the last segment, we were speaking about uh, Buchenwald and the. Um, I imagine we're speaking about before the liberation. So just take us back to those last that last period in Buchenwald. Last period was about the, I would say January, February, Mar March. In February, March, April 11th, we were liberated. So the last segment of the Buchenwald was like, uh, do you say, a Durchgangslager? What I mean, bringing people, taking out people, bringing people, bringing things. Thinking now people sending an aid, march them out. Uh, some people, most of the people, they, they were shot outside some place. And there was, uh, they, uh, cause because at one point, Mar I mean, uh, Buchenwald, the capacity was 20,000. And at one point, 80,000. So how is it, you know, so uh, that, you know, that's, uh, so they had, they had to march people out uh, to their death. I mean, uh, because uh, otherwise uh, they couldn't, uh, you know, they couldn't, the Germans themselves, they couldn't handle it. Well, so because uh, at the end already, you know the famous Elsa Koch, Elsa Koch. You know, mm -hmm. you know who she was. Elsa Koch. Could you just explain that. She was. She was the commander's wife. Oh yes, of yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry, of course. Elsa Koch. She. I have a picture that she had. Uh, Horrible individual. Lamp, Horrible. Lampshade made out of human skin. Lampshade the two figures in the office, a male, a male and a woman figure, you know, human figures. How can, is that, are these uh, well, not uh, normal people with the world? I can say, if you're looking at across from you, you see, uh, a uh, dead figure in front of you, and uh, you know, a human figure. Can you be, can comprehend that? Can you understand that? I don't know how they were so, how I should I say, brainwashed or whatever you call it from Hitler that they know, uh, I think she was vicious. She was very, as a, as a matter of fact, when I came to America, I have, I had still have a few pictures. I had a whole, maybe eight, ten pictures from Buchenwald. That they were taken to Germans, the Americans when they came in. I sent copies to, to the New York Times. They printed it in those because of course in America they didn't they didn't want to believe what happened, especially not our people. Even all the people. I remember after the war I came first time I went out to buy a suit. <laughs> so I went up to a Jewish place. And not the religious line. He asked me, is that true? They killed six million Jews in Europe? I mean, that I wasn't saying it was, a, was almost a normal question, right? Because we couldn't believe such a thing. Anyway, so we went to Mohammed in the 
No, the, the, when, in the last couple of months, it was like said a dog then I was always under the impression I'm not moving from here. I'm not going any place more. That's it. What a life or that. This is it. I'm not. Whatever I could, they called my son. They called my name. And as I told you before, I was out on the pamphlets and. Uh, and gave this guy a big rat, the couple and was another. So they sent me home another time. I, oh, they also was given a chance to stay longer. I worked one couple of times in the Steinbach, and they, they, where they, they you know, digging the, the, the stones down the, in the ditches, and you know, what it is. So uh, I always somehow managed to stay a little above, because, I don't know, because God gave me the machshava, the, the, the thinking about it. So stay, stay alive, stay alive. Or the, was my father's promise that he said he's not going to make a speculation. You know, make me bold of it, a lot of it. And, uh, so I, when the liberation came, the last few days, it was already, we, we had. Uh, airplanes on the air, you know? All the, and every day, every day, they, they try to get, take out more people from Buchenwald. And so, and all of a sudden, <coughs> an alarm came that the plane was approaching. That's what, that was the last couple of days. So the Germans ran away and then left the stage like this, you know. All in, uh, so one time they called out in my name. This was probably uh, two weeks before the liberation, or before April 11, 1945. And I uh, come here, uh, and uh, I go on the pamphlet, and I stretch myself out. And all things, everybody, they're marching the people out, and I'm laying down. So what happened? So the German comes over and starts hitting, hitting, hitting me. And I had that belt on me that was what I wore that time, and I had wooden shoes. And they were marching out. One, one boy tried to take off my wooden shoes. And I was laying like that because the Germans thought I was already. And he tried to take off my tries to take off my wooden shoes, and I gave him a little kick. So you saw him still alive. So, uh, you know, <laughs> he didn't take them, uh, you know. And all of this, so, uh, uh, so planes came. So I moved, I had pushed myself, I rolled myself a little further down, like to the street, was the barrack. I hid myself under the barrack. Now I was laying there overnight. Overnight, the next morning, the same thing called out. And all of a sudden, in the morning, I'm not around. So they ran away. I put myself back. A day later, the two days later, I don't remember exactly. So I was under the barracks. All of a sudden, we hear something. Noise, noise. The Americans are here. 
Americans came. Uh, you know, so uh, one thing that all oh, got up in the body, you know, and uh, the first thing I did, which a lot of people did, was uh, we, uh, we went the next to the village. The, uh, the, uh, no, the, yeah, went to the villages. The only people that lived in the area and they took their food and this and they made myself comfortable. Excuse me, excuse me, what you know where in the bathroom? And I made myself eggs or whatever. <laughs> and went in and went out. That, you know, that was the first thing. Uh, then, uh, and I was, uh, I had uh, typhoid at that point. I was laid up in, in, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the infirmary. Uh -huh. In the infirmary. In the infirmary. And it's, I don't know, I remember exactly, but I, a week or two weeks later, I got out myself, I walked out, and uh, I started uh, organi organizing, they call this organizing food. I mean, uh, arranging for, for myself food and uh, to eat whatever I could. I, I, I jumped on jeeps, American jeeps were parked in, outside, in, outside the camp. And, uh, I went, I, so I, I raided jeeps for food. And one jeep I raided it, I saw a kosher salami. It was, so, <laughs> it had a book and do it, and it had, I think, 999, the, the, the kosher. The, I, of course I finished it right away. <laughs> the poor soldiers didn't have what to eat. You know, and I and then we I walked we walked to Weimar, which wasn't far, and got food. And I saw an American soldier standing on guard there, and he shows me he was wearing scissors. I, I I thought I was dreaming, but this is still, but uh, there's still Jews around, you know. And then, at the beginning, I don't know. If I, I, I thought that it's going to be a world out there, you know. So then, uh, so when Rabbi Shechter came, I think it came right away or not, because I was not with him at that point, right away, because I had typhoid and was laid up. And then. Uh, you know, and, uh, then he, he, he came and he, we went and he gathered all the Jews into the, the, the um, you know, the hall by the Germans celebrated the festivities. And maybe, uh, who knows, maybe eight, ten thousand Jews. And said, Ye, Yiden, we are then a do for Eich. Jews, we are here for you. Please remember you, the Jews, and we're going to help you, whatever you can. And then, of course, what, uh, uh, they started dying, up, and Shavuos came, and, uh, and uh, they down together. And then, then they had a, a Swiss Red Cross committee came to gather teenagers to, for recuperation in Switzerland. So they called in uh, uh, you know, Major Glickman, you know, how old are you? Seventy nine. Okay, good. Next person went in. Solomon, Mr. Solomon, how old are you? 21. No, you're not a teenager. So he, the Rabbi Shechter, 
and another man, Mr. Tito, was the, he was in the concentration in Buchenwald five years, and he know he knew the in and out of everything. So they falsified the papers. Mm. The other one he became a teenager, the twenty-five year old. And so uh, at the, the, uh, oh, by the way, I, before that, I knew that my cousin, a cousin of mine, that we were brought up together, survived. She's Burton Belson. I hitched a right to Burton Belson. Burton Belson, oh. excuse me, from Buchenwald was about 500 kilometers. Going there, so I, uh, I, I found out that uh, uh, this uh, 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 English officer is going, he was in Bochenwald, and he's going back to, to the uh, to Berlin building. He was stationed there when he liberated it. So I hitched a ride with him to Bochum, to Berlin building. And I said, my cousin, nobody else was around, nobody else alive. Please come. I'm going to Switzerland. And we go together. But she didn't want to do it. She didn't want it. She had friends. She was, in the mood. She was afraid. Not everybody was so lucky, you know, up in the, you know, ready to do things. So, okay, so I went back. Back. I couldn't get it. I took me three days to get back. From back in Belsen to Buchenwald. From How back long were you in back in Belsen? What? How long were you in back in Belsen? How long? I wasn't there a day. A day. I didn't stay long because I, I knew I had to get back because they didn't, you know, they, um, they, they, they wouldn't want to. The, the, the Swiss, of course, wouldn't want to wait for me. Because they're not most uh, friendly people in the world, and for, especially for Jews. Mm -hmm. So they came back, and they me a got. And then uh, it was in time that the okay, went in, other people went in. Uh, you know, how old? Uh, uh, how old? 25. No, no good. So, okay. Meanwhile, this is Rabbi Shechter, and, uh, and this guy, the, and Tito, they changed the document, the papers. Everybody became a teenager. And a teenager, so it wound up 350 boys and girls being teenagers. So, okay, so we go, they, they, they loaded us up in the, you know, in the trains, and we went to Switzerland for, for, for recuperation. So, okay, Sky, we drove to Switzerland and drove, but I don't remember how long. Anyway, so I remember it was a Friday night, the Abbechef to stop the train. And we all uh, get, get down to Daven. She wanted to Daven, the Hudoidi. She the Hudoidi. And then, it's the first time I heard the American Hudoidi. The Hudoidi, because I love and I hate That's the American Hudoidi. So, so, and then we came to the Swiss border. The, 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 Swiss, the control, border control came up. And they see 350 boys and girls, one is 25, one is 30, one is all teenagers. Hey, well, we said he was with an Amishakta, who came, and was also with an American officer. The escort. 
And then they said, we cannot let these people in. They're not teenagers. So the other chef they got up and said, OK, don't do it. We'll call, it, we'll call the press. We'll see. Let them see, you know. Let them hear what, what you're going to well, You know, that they, you don't let these poor people in. Well, so they got a little, you know, shaken up. They got a little scared. You know, the presence, you know, you know, people that come barely living can't go to recuperate a little. Well, so okay, they let us in and came, and they divided us. At this point, me, I had a picture here. I had. A mother and a father, and they gave me a mother and father, uh, of course, they're going, and they, and they put us in a in, uh, home like the, for cooperation in the, the, the psych, uh, sanitarium or whatever it's called, you know. Uh, and they gave us food, and they, uh, at night they put us to sleep. Uh, See, the, day, the moment starts to rain, <laughs> they read us from the, from the heli masses, from the, from about the, <laughs> the Yaisal. See, they read stories. So, <laughs> anyway, then came, later, a few weeks later, came the organizations, the Jewish organizations. And they made, you know, and they started taking us out. Some people, they, they some, they the Jewish organizations, the yeah. the Varhatsala, the Jaguarisro, uh, the Mitzrachi, the Yungizri, or whatever. And they're good. They started, and they took us out, and they, and they asked people. They, where do you want to go? Some people went to Mitrach and some went to the left, the Zionists, about the organization. Uh, the left, the, 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 left the, the, I, of course, uh, coming from opponents in Spoche, I belonged to the Agora. And so in the Agora, they the, the had Kinderheims, what's called children's home in Engelberg, Switzerland. You know, that, that's where I was sent with a group of friends, a lot of people there. And then we came back to ourselves and uh, we learned this. First we were, of course, by this uh, Red Cross, uh, you know, organization to, to you know, to recuperate and then I was in Engelberg. Over there, it was already, it was there, it was, it was uh, after June, May, June, yeah. And then came Yontef, or Shishuna, and I still was in, uh, in Engelberg, and, and Simchas Torah. This guy, Chaim Gittler, he was the director there in, the, in, this, in the Kinderheim in Engelberg. And they had a separate section for girls, you know, another building. And he called me out and he says, I have a telegram for you. Telegram for me? What's going to be telegrams at this point? He says, it says, Yosef Borough Glickman. The son of Rabshia Glickman is alive in Belgium. That was my brother. I, could, I, I couldn't believe it. I didn't believe it. They sent him to Auschwitz. He was a Muslim and he was a skeleton already, you know? And him and a hundred boys was sent as skeletons to Auschwitz 
And here comes Mengele, and he says, I can, I can still take out a few boys that they can work a couple of days. He burned thousands, thousands a day. And here comes a hundred skeletons. And, they, and he says, they still, they're, ach, the boys going to lie, still license for us, you know, for a dog. All of a sudden, takes out ten boys, my brother, and in a friend of his, that he got to know a friend from Belgium, his age. They got, to, you know, they got, to, you know, they got to know each other. How did they get to know each other? Because my mother was always very, I mean, from and he remembers a lot. He, in Auschwitz, he, Friday night, he was singing to himself, and this boy heard this. And he said, so he said to him, what? My father sings that. His father was also from, you know, singing that same song on Friday night at that home. So also they, they stuck to each other. And they both, both were liberated. Uh, and uh, uh, so my... Uh, Go back and say, okay, I'll end off with my brother first. And, and my brother knew that nothing to do, you know, in Poland, nothing to go back to, nobody was there. We knew, you know, that nobody was there. Your parents, your parents, parents were yeah, murdered yeah, out. Sure, you know, we knew, two, I knew. Your two brother. sisters I and knew, your younger yeah, brother. I knew, we knew that, that was not sure. In the concentration camp, we knew already. The date and everything that they were sent to Auschwitz. Only, only a doubt I had of my, my sister, older sister, that she might be alive. But unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. She was the last one in the, in the ghetto, don't such a bit, you know, working. The last 400 people, she, she was sent down. So he got, he got a whole, he got together with this boy, and the Belgium government sent people, I mean, a committee, to find its citizens, not like the Polish. Polish didn't care who you, if they do. Oh, you, in Poland, they used to say, oh, you're still alive? You know, this was the Polish. But the Belgium, so this boy, Moshe, was a Belgian, born in Belgium. So he, the Belgian government, came and they took him back. I mean, the commission, the committee came and he spoke Flemish, French, everything. He was born in Antwerp. So, uh, so my brother said, I'm going with you. How are you going? I said, well, okay, I'm going. You're not a citizen, you're not Belgian. You know? So don't worry. So, so I came today. The border with the border, you know, border control. See, they started asking questions. Oh, this boy, boy, must have spoke to the, the French, the Belgian, and, you know. Okay, said, who's this? My brother. Started talking, to asking him questions in, in Flemish. So he started to sing La Houdoidi. So I so they say this. So he says, oh, he's my brother, but he's still a, still a little mental now from all the tourists, from all these things. So he got into him, and 
unfortunately enough, his father and his two sisters three sisters this emotion survived they were in a monastery mm-hmm. hidden by the Belgians some place on the way not in Antwerp but some place in another place I forgot the name of the anyway. so he found he married one of his daughters I mean the one of Uh, we're back with uh, Mr. Glickman, and uh, we left off. Uh, you were speaking about the deportations that were occurring in the Sosnova ghetto, and I would like to uh, take you back there, and um, we'll begin there. Yes, it said in 1942, it was uh, in August 14th, I was in Elbrus, Scottish, Elbrus. They gathered all the Jews from Sosnovitz, Bendin, Gombor, as I said before, the whole Schlesia area, and everyone in each, at the football pitch in each city. And they said, excuse for changing documentation. So, of course, we, everybody went. Nushim, Nushim Vataf, let's say. Children, grown up children, and we were dressed in our summary. It was Ellen. And uh, it started to pour, and as I said before, and from there, so we, we, had, uh, we stayed there all night. And the next morning... When you say all night, you were li- lying in the field. What? In the field. In, open, yeah, in, the, f- in, the, in the football field mm-hmm. all night. And the next morning, they came out, the Germans, with the, brought out some tables and brought out hound dogs and this, and they started making the selection. Mm-hmm. And the selection was whoever had a little documentation, they were let out. Like, for instance, when, when we came to our family together, all families that go together. You know, so my father, my mother, and my sister, and my brother, two, two sisters, and my one brother. We went, and I and my brother that lives in, in Borough Park went to, you know, to this table where they were standing on the, the, the Nazis and, you know. And I, we, I had a document that I worked for Katowice, for the Germans, and my brother, older brother, also had a document. So they said, you go, you go home. Well, we, we ran home. We didn't, we didn't think we shouldn't go home or we should stay with my parents. My father said, go, go. It must so have been did. a very, very terrifying moment. What? must have been a, it was a very terrifying moment. A very, very terrifying moment. After all night and standing, getting wet and getting all... <laughs> I, you know, no food, no nothing, you know. It was a very terrible, and how? At this point, my mother started to cry to my father. She didn't worry about herself, but she was worried about us. She didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't tell her that we are going home. They didn't know this. It was so, uh, what I was for tumult, everybody. But they didn't, you know, didn't, she didn't realize that they got some, uh, out there, uh, go home. So she said, my father, uh, what's going to be with the Yossel and Mayor? And my father said, don't worry. 
Lord, if it's a incantation, say, two sons to say courage for us. That was a wonder when my father said that. Because we, we went through three years from 1942 to 1945 in so many concentration camps and, uh, and uh, you know, they were almost dead. So when we're here, when you are, and now I'm here and uh, discussing about it, mm. you know, so just talking about it. So at that point, uh, they put my parents, my uh, uh, the families, they emptied the houses as I said before, and they put those people that they couldn't send away immediately, they put them in empty houses. Empty houses, so my parents were there with his family. We were out. And uh, so at a certain, uh, as they went to the houses, and this guy, Mary Mirin, like I mentioned before, the head of the Jewish commander, the, 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 he had power. He took took my parents out from there a few days later, and also my uh, uncle with his family, also a roof of Halbishnam, David Halbishnam. So it was also a roof and his uncle. So they, he took them out and stay, we stayed home at that point. Then, in 1942, they started to build the ghetto already. That's when, so at this point, when, when the, this morning, Marine figured that maybe young people will survive better if they, he sends them to labor camps. They became, so one night they grabbed us because I was sleeping as I said, my, my uh, uncle, my brother sleeping on, and they took us into this house. From there they sent us to camps. When they, so my father ran to see this marine that should take us out, you know, you know because he had, the, he had uh, as they say, the power to do it. But he didn't want to see him. I remember my father was standing in, in the street, across the street, and we saw him through the, in the, from the building, uh, the window, where he kept us for a couple of days until they sent us away. He was walking back and forth and uh, saying goodbye to us. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so the, the first of all, they sent us away, and that, on the, the first camp they sent us was called Sakrau. Sakrau was in Schlesien. Schlesien is uh, in, is uh, near Breslau, the, it was called the, you know, the, the, the area was called, the, uh, near Breslau. This, in Sakram, they had, they had, they, we, they made us load cement from, from a warehouse to the wagons that they shipped away. Everybody had to carry a sack of cement on his back. And this was, you can imagine, that uh, this was, uh, maybe I'll step back before, a little before that. Because when they let us out, why did they let us, as I said, I had a, uh, a document that worked for the Germans and my brother also. We worked in Katowice. I was sweeping the street and in the winter, in the summer, and uh, when it started to snow, we had uh, 
stopped the snow away from the, that was already German territory. Katowice, they annexed right away as a German city because it was Poland. So we worked there and we came home. One day, they grabbed us from Katowice and they sent us with the, the, the work in the, in the, what do you call it, in the steel mill. Steel mill. I remember the, 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 the way they melt the steel, there's fire coming down from the, the, the mills, the openings, and it's into a way, you know, into trolleys. And we had to push the trolley to another section. No gloves, no nothing, nothing. And at the next day, this Monic Marine got us out. Otherwise, we, I wouldn't have been in here. I mean, I have to, I have to give a little credit to a certain thing for this Monic Marine. Because the cause of his, I, you know, I can't judge him because he knew. But on the other hand, he took young people and sent them to the labor camps. And he didn't know it's going to become a concentration camp. He, maybe, because <coughs> first there was labor camps. We had, we didn't have Nazis watching us. We had. Soldiers, uh, German soldiers, not the Nazis, not the SS, you know, the soldier. Uh, so it wasn't as harsh as it became later when the SS took over. And that was 1942, uh, the end of 42 it changed. We were sent to uh, uh, the Markstadt, called Markstadt, to say the labor camp. Uh, we had, <coughs> you know, you had a Jew, a Jew camp. Uh, what is it called? A Lagerführer, the camp commander. Camp commander was when we came, and so when they grabbed us, and I slept by my uncle. And, uh, and uh, my brother, a different uncle, and they took us out from there. My father went to the, my, he didn't want to see him. And they said, and, they, and two days later, they shipped us away. So, so, as I said, first we went to Sakra, Sakra, we stayed only a week, and they sent us to call the, the city called Markstadt. Mark that they wanted, you know, he started to work. I, uh, so when we came there, and my brother, older brother, he knew more more than I about uh, life in Sosnovitz, or the Mishpucha, the people, and this. And he knew this, uh, this guy, they had the uh, Lagerfeuer, the Jewish guy, was called Boruch Meister. This Boruch Meister was from a, he was a, a Polish officer in Poland before the war. And he became, he was like a commander, you know. And my father, and his father used to be, was a Belzechuset. So, even, so he, he, my brother remembered him. He just come during the war. He, I think he used to come to down by us, the father. So we come there, and you know, my brother goes over to him. He wants to talk to him. And they said, what? You're going to get talk to Borum? I said, everybody said he's, he's vicious. So he said, so he said, yeah, let me, I want to talk to him. He said, talk to him? 
I didn't. What's, what's, what's Wills to do? You know, what's, what's, I have regard from your father. He became a different person. Oh, yes, it's a father, you know. Oh, it's the rebel. You know, I tell you, you know, oh, it's a rebel. I gave him a, a, a lot and I get a job. So he said, I had my brother, so, you know. Oh, well, so we had, we worked, not so, it wasn't so bad. I was uh, painting barracks or something like this. And my brother was also doing the same. And, uh, until 19, uh, when did it become? They evacuated in 1940, end of 43. They evacuated. Uh, Park shot, and they sent us to Fünfteichen. Then it became a concentration camp. Before it was a labor camp. After the labor camp became a concentration camp, and a concentration camp was already the, the, the SS on that control of the SS. So this camp was Fünfteichen. Well, what? The name of the camp was? Fünf Teichen. Teichen. And this was Fünf already in Germany or was it still in Poland? What? No, it wasn't in Germany. It was in Germany. Yeah, Fünf Teichen, Germany. In Poland. And Sakura was also in Germany, mm -hmm. but the lower part of Germany, near Breslau. Right. right. You know, so, yeah, this was a, it became a concentration camp. It was already, uh, you know, it was, uh, well, how do you call it? At that point, they separated us because my brother was a very stickle Muslim. Muslim is a skeleton. You know, I was sent to in Seichen. I don't know where he was sent. He sent. I know now, at that point, I didn't know that he was sent to a different camp until, uh, the, until you know, he worked. Uh, he was uh, making the cannons, working, the, putting in the, uh, the uh, what you call it, the powder in the cannons. And, you know, uh, ammunition. So they... How old were you when your brother and you were separated? How old were you? Uh, I was in uh, 1943. Uh, I, uh, I was before Bar Mitzvah in 1939. So how old you were about I? 15 years old, 15, uh -huh. 15 and a half years yeah, old. Yeah, half, probably. So, uh, so you uh, were separated and... Yeah, then. separated then. I, I knew it was... Uh, and <clears throat> and I, so I didn't know for me anymore. And I was in Mark Schott, working in the concentration camp there. And uh, every morning, you got up five o'clock of hotel, you know, we woke us up and we had to go and we got a, a little a, a little piece of bread that made me mostly made out of chestnuts. No no flour and uh, 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 a little soup, maybe. Why is the phone ringing? It's okay, we'll, we'll just ignore yeah. it. We'll just ignore yeah, I shut it. I do forgot to shut it off. <laughs> so we, we move on. So you're receiving yeah. Yeah. Uh, bread made yeah. from, from chestnuts. Yeah. And then we had to uh, go out to work. Uh, we worked till the, of course, till the evening. And uh, we came back, and that was going on for a while, like this, and, they, and every time they came, they, 
they would say, hey, that, you're not working good, you're not working enough, this and that. And one day, there came a commission, and we had a foreman. Foreman was not from Chensokov. We heard of Chensokov, mm -hmm. near, not far from Bendin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Foreman, he became a Volksdeutscher. A, uh, a folk which I mean the, the annexed the area. Ethnic, uh, ethnic Germans. Uh, yeah. Well, the, so, in the commission, in, in the, to assess big, from, come from, they came from Gross Rosen. This belonged to, my concentration and Finsteichen belonged to, not to Auschwitz. I don't have a number. Only to go outdoors. Go outdoors and they didn't give me numbers. So there came a commission and they asked the foreman, uh, do you arbeiten? He said, you couldn't speak, you could hardly speak German. He said, nine. That's all I had to hear. They started hitting everybody. And then it came to me, you know, and then I'm going back. And so, and, this, and so at this point, they, we they marched us into back after the evening into the concentration camp, and they said, Commando. Kreutz and Lesch, I was, that was the, I worked for. It was Kreutz and Lesch. It was a German company laying tracks. And I have this finger, see, fell on a track. And you see, uh, hmm. see this nail? The nail is not the same. Mm -hmm. And lock him in, uh, so in the split open here. And uh, luckily, I, they put me into the revere. The revere is a, a, a what's it called? A, 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 here you go, a medical center, what it's called. Uh, Looks like your finger was split right open. This finger was split right open here. Yeah. See? Split open because they laying the tracks. We had to do it by hand, not with the, not with the prongs that they pick up here. That see when they lay a track from one place on uh, prongs, we had to put it with the hands. So then it fell on my finger. So uh, then they say they put me in the revere there, and, they, and luckily. This man that was in charge there, a, a, a Gentile, he was from Sosnovitz. Hmm. So he, he, he bandaged me up, whatever he could, no stitches, no, no, no stitches. He bandaged me up. And, 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 and I was there maybe two days in that. Uh, uh, called uh, uh, medical uh, facility, and the man, after two days, he told me they're coming from Gross Rosen, the commission, uh, and Auschwitz, so they're not complete, and they're going to take all the people out the water and cannot work anymore. They said, you go back to work tomorrow. You're going back to work tomorrow. Took off the bandages and said, whatever you can do, you do. Go back, because otherwise they'll send you to Auschwitz. And, and you know, it's, everything is, uh, mm, uh, but that I have to live. Live, you know what I mean. Every every step of my movements is like that, to show me that I'm going to survive. I didn't think at that time. Now, I know, later on in life, I think about it and I realize that every every 
moment that they had the little things. And that time going to some of my house, is it possible that I go, I said, well, he, he, he cared if I live or not. Just go at the pollock. I, I don't know if he cared, but he, he told me. So when I went back to work, and one day, they, they, they saw when this, the, the, the foreman, said that we not were not working. They do they do not do not enough work. So we knew something is gonna happen that day. When we came back into the uh, after work uh, so they announced Kreuz and Lesh stehen bleiben. That means we shouldn't disperse, we shouldn't go to the barracks. We have to stay there. Stay there. So they pulled out, they had, I want to call it, a, a, a box where you put your feet, feet in, and you, and you have uh, this, and if you, and you can't move your feet, and, you, uh, you, and up here you have to put your hands on it, and they saw. So they give you lashes, because we didn't work enough that day. This, so, so I, okay, so everybody got, uh, supposed to get 25, 30 lashes. One, uh, uh, I says on this side and on this side, I'm whipping, pulled out the, and the, and the men that didn't pull down the pants. Okay, I, I was I wasn't so bad. I wasn't hit so bad. They gave me only fifteen, twelve, fifteen lashes. Well, not so <laughs> not so bad. But came the others, the bigger people, the others. They gave more. It came to the couple, which was. A friend of mine, I would say, he and by the way, at one point when they, I had picked up my head and he says the former, the, the assessor was there at that time, he goes with the shovel, give me over the head. He gave me such a, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, how do you say it in Yiddish, a flick. Mm -hmm. And you know, that I stretch out on the floor. But the, in order to avoid, the, 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 the German shouldn't hit me with the shovel. Mm -hmm. You know, so and we came home, they go, they were still, we had to stay and wait, and they came out to uh, the Nazis, and one on this side, and one, and we put the feet in, and the hands like this. And, and again, I got maybe 12, 13 lashes, and everybody, some people got more, some people less. It came, it came to the head couple, which was, was, he was a nice man. So it's a coming later. So he knew, we knew. He had a sweater on him. Yeah, so you put it on his back, on his behind. So you know that he's going to get back. But they said, pull his pants down. They pulled his pants down. They saw the sweater there. Wow, they got a hold of him. Seventy-five lashes he got. Seventy-five. I cannot. I cannot picture that. They must have. They must have left him almost dead. Seventy-five lashes. So we didn't know what happened. We pulled him in the washroom because he was a good man, a good man, a very good man. But you know, honestly. Unfortunately, it became a cop of what I do suppose, you know. We pulled him in the washroom. We put him on schmatis and everybody took off whatever he had. 
put them on cold water, cold water, cold water, this and that. Baruch Hashem, he survived. This is, uh, you know, beginning, it was in uh, 43, no, it was not the, the end of the war yet. And he survived, as a matter of fact, it's going to come, uh, as a matter of fact, we moved, we lived in Israel for a while. And so uh, we made up our midst from our son in Israel. I said to my wife, we have to look him up. We have to go and invite him to the bar mitzvah. Found out his telephone number, then Petach Tekva, and we called him. I said, Leibniz Meshman, yeah. Do that, my Gleekman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to come to visit you. Okay, so I came up, took my family, who came to visit you. They said, we're making a bar mitzvah. Would like to have you. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Of course, of time, he never showed up. Because of his past. You know, only the word that he was a couple, Scheunischkeit, you know, it's not good. The name. Although he saved a lot of people. What they hit before. The Germans started hitting you on the on the boat, on the working, you know, where you worked. You saw, you saw a German wants to hit you, so he he did it before in order to avoid the Germans. And, but the name is thing alone. So that yeah, yeah that is the nineteen forty-three, then forty-four. And from the Steichen, when the Hungarians started to arrive. See, new, new faces. Uh, Hungarians, uh, uh, so at the beginning, uh, we were lucky because they didn't want to eat the food that they gave there, you know? Because you're thinking, oh, we're only here, only here for a couple of weeks, or da, 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 you know, this and this and that, you know. So uh, we, we were, I was, uh, you know, thinking that they, they didn't realize that they're here in a concentration camp at the beginning. They thought a couple of weeks I'll be out. We were, uh, unfortunately, they, you know, they, they uh, how should I say, they, they, they couldn't handle it as much as we could handle it. I don't know why, because a lot of them couldn't make it, didn't make it. We, we I was there years, a few, two years already, 1940 uh, and uh, 42, 1943, and this was um, in June, I think, of 44. Yeah, they came, they, f they felt like, like flies. I can't say, I, you know, they could, yeah, I don't know. And we were, you know, we, I don't know, maybe because uh, the, uh, the reason I don't know. But uh, that's unfortunate. We were <clears throat> then, this is under 44, the start, so this was not far from the Polish border, the, when the Russians started approaching. As soon as the Russians started, they heard the Germans that they are getting closer, they started to march us out. 
we had, you know, in, we, we were marching from one place to another till, <coughs> yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the Germans were running away also because the Russians are coming. So what happened? So, you know, we were already Muslim on the skeletons. If somebody fell down, they shot them, left them on the road, you know? And the Germans were driving by with the wagons and seeing that. They didn't see it. They didn't bother them. Not at all. Didn't bother them. They ran over them. And, or they pushed them in the side. Because I don't know how many thousand we had left from this thing on today. A few, a nice few thousand. And, you know, and here we're marching, 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 also more close, more into Germany, deeper into Germany. And uh, uh, so at, uh, you know, and here they do the things, you know, they kill, they run away and they see, see a, a dead body, you know. They didn't, didn't, they didn't care. And, 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 and so and remember when we were marching, I they gave each one a half a loaf of bread. We had made out of things before the, we marched out. I had, I had in my thing, my hoist and those things tied up with the, 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 the half the, the, you know, this thing, the, uh, what you call it, the uniform. And mm -hmm. so I had it tied up here. So I put a piece of bread in it, so it would fall out, you know. And uh, we were marching, and one night, and it was in the winter, of course, it's uh, the December, uh, and there were 44. It's snowing, snowing all the time, and the people, and they, and they, and they said, said that the Germans were running away, and, this, and we, at one point, the 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 water who oh, the watchman so had the German officer officer going marching out and dancing they were marching us they put us into a, a barn just overnight I and I had a bread with me a stick of bread I was afraid to go to sleep. In the barn, in the barn, why? Somebody was top to see the field and the sea of bread. They would kill me for it. Some of the, some of the, not the Jewish, they have in this uh, Ukraine going also. You know, so I slept outside in the snow. All night next next to the watchman. And it was snowing and me snowing and snowing. And I was buried in snow. I, and I got up in the morning. And the next day we marched. And we came in the, at the other place. And we walked into Cross Roads. That's the way I, we belong. I have, Oh, I have documentation from Brussels. And here, I forgot to bring it to prepare us that my name is there and my profession. I was a, I was a Tischler. Tischler is a carpenter. You know? Because my son went to Washington the Holocaust Museum. He discovered this, my name, my documentation from, you know, from, from Gwasaws. And, uh, you know, Gwasaws was, 
but can I tell you what was maybe say seven to eighty thousand people. People were laying in mud. People were doing then I don't know. Uh, well, I really don't know where I slept. I don't say that I don't. I you know. I remember one thing that I slept under a barrack someplace because I don't recall putting being put up someplace. How long were you in Großhausen? Großhausen, we Let's were there. Maybe. Uh, Maybe a month or so, maybe two months. So because and then because I remember what um, one thing I had is uh, somebody that worked in the kitchen there was from Sosnovitz, and they were disciples of my grandfather, my father, and my and they were very close with us. He, he, they were called the Mandelbaum, and so they have, they left, they survived, they lived in Canada, and I think that one, one sister lives here, in Turin, I don't know why, Turin and the cheese, and the cheese, you know, all of cheese is called Turin, Caesar, Caesar Mandelbaum. Uh, so uh, they worked in the kitchen. They gave me a little soup all the time, a little soup. And, uh, and I, at one point, I heard that my cousin, Lindel Halberstam, we, brought up, we were brought up together in Sosnowitz, that he's arriving from his camp in Gorsosen. So I prepared for him a little soup. They, then, then we, uh, a month later, we were sent, we were loaded into cattle cars. The cattle cars, uh, and we didn't know where we were going. Cattle cars, uh, 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 cattle car can, well, can hold uh, 50, 60 people, or whatever. You know, can hold 20 people. We we'll put 60, 80 people, or maybe more, in, a, in this cattle car. And, you know, laying one on top of the other. You know, because, and, yeah, so, uh, and they, we were in the train, in that cattle car train, uh, and we, a couple of days and nights, maybe four or five days and nights. Because you couldn't, they didn't go so fast because also the, the American planes uh, are coming or something, you know. They may be bombarding, so they didn't, they, until they came to Weimar. Weimar, Weimar Republic, you know, that's near Bochenwald. Right, uh, maybe well, ten kilometers, whatever. Just, uh, not uh, maybe a little more. I can't tell the exact. Uh, uh, Weimar uh, unloaded us. Unloaded. They opened up the cattle cars. How many people survived after three nights and three days, or maybe four nights and four days in this cattle car? Most of the people were gone, you know. I wound myself out and I saw a garbage, a garbage dump. And I laid myself on this garbage pong and I ate whatever there was. And then they drove us, I don't know how, they marched us to Buchenwald. They marched in Buchenwald, people fell off flights and they said, I came, I came, came to Buchenwald. In Buchenwald they had, they, in Buchenwald itself, they had the, the 
Bu arada the, 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 the management was uh, it was a, a political hafflingers, political prisoners. Little prisoners. Uh, the communists or whatever, they, you know. Going, they had a Jew, they had a Yid uh, that was there, that came a close friend of us, which was there five years in Bochumwald. Anyway, so we came in, came in there, and they had to enlose us. They, they, they gave us a shower to clean us up, because we never, you know, we came, we came to this. The, the, the washroom, as they say, and the couple there in the washroom tells me, you stay here. Don't go out after the, the, they shower you. So I stayed there naked. I was there two, two days naked. I drank the water, it's whatever they, because why didn't tell me that later on I found out. He says the next two days later they had brought in a group from a Hungary boy from Hungary, boys from Hungary. And they showered them and they, he said push yourself in with these boys. I went. I said, okay. I went with these boys after we got dressed, and, and they started talking to me in Hungarian. I said, them to them. <laughs> I said, oh, Len the name I realized. I said, Lenger, you know, a Jew, a Polish Jew. I'm okay for a Polish Jew because they had empty a barrack, a good barrack. Because the other people, why did you tell me I should wait? Because the other people that came, they had no room in the, all the barracks. They put them in the mud, someplace down, and, you know, they were laying, my cousin was laying the mud. You know, it came, you know. as a matter of fact, I didn't know. I met him there. Well, in Bochum, I met him in Guatemala and also. I mean, he gave me a little zoom, but we were separated. We didn't, uh, not together. So, and so he said, me go, this couple in Washington tells me, go in with them, I go in with them. I remember when they put us in the barrack, the barrack was going, 49, number 49. This was a more or less a barrack that it, it stretched out seven, eight people on this wooden thing, but not in the mud. So it wasn't Mokham Valley that was the end of uh, Probably uh, a month later than now, to, uh, yeah, at the end of December, January, yeah, probably, you know, was no time. To, uh, so over there, and they, and I, but I was, what did I say, uh, hanging out, what, what, and then, you know, one time, at one point, they called, and I had a number, and they called out my number, and they, and they had to line up on the Pell Plus, I was with, Let's say two thousand people, and I lined up my number, and I turned around. I see this couple, Jewish couple, that was in Markstadt, with this Jewish, he, he, Moshe Mechtinger. He was a vicious guy, and he is standing behind me. I said, what? So I, I, with all my might, I gave him such a, a kick. 
the commander had the assessment comes over to me. Oh, come here. Warum hast du ihn geschlagen? Why did you hit him? I said, he geschlagen me in the, in the other lager at the second station. I couldn't do that. In the other lager, he said, Ach, lauf mal zurück. Go back in the barrack. Ah, du bist noch einmal zu jung zu haben. Du bist immer weg dabei. Ich don't know. I might send some place else. I mean, probably send out to work or something. Or maybe not. Maybe who knows where. But because I know that this guy survived. They did. They hung him in Poland. They did. Yeah. So I, I so I, I went back to the bank, and then uh, another time, they said to me, you know, called me out again, and I was, I to say, always a little ahead of the game. Why? I could organize myself. I could get something to eat, no matter what. I always, I mistake, I don't know how. You, you know, they used to peel potatoes for the Germans. And the, you know, and the peels of the potatoes, they wheeled it outside and dumped it in a dump. dump to dump them outside. I used to grab. On, on the horse of buggy, and here was the watchman on top looking down and see, and he would try to kill me. And I managed to run away. I grabbed the, I, I, two ones full of potato peels, I put them in my pants, and he was looking to feed And I, you know, and I hid myself here. I wasn't lucky enough to do it. And, I, and one time I gave, and I came to the barrack. I gave somebody, this guy survived, Spitzer is his name. I gave him a couple of peels of potatoes. I shared it with somebody, I don't know how to had the thing to share, but he said, he said to me, at that time, I didn't realize he was an older man, a religious man, survived this, was in Bora Park he lived. He said that, in the homage, he said, Tama kotzapiach bedwash. And the taste is like dough dipped in honey. That's what he said at that time. <laughs> I, I didn't realize. Now I know that later on I looked it up. And it says, you know, Peshalach, I think now it's coming up. And, you know, so, soon. You know? Uh, so, again, in this, in, so uh, and another point, I, you know, I said, uh, I saw. Uh, <coughs> My cousin, Mr. Mendel Halberstam, he, in, in, uh, he said, I asked him, what, what, he was going to register, he wants to get out of there because he was laying in the mud. So, I said, where are you, where are you going to go? Another, another uh, hall or whatever, or whatever, or they put you to work someplace. And another point uh, is uh, they, uh, he was talking about, and, uh, and I, uh, uh, on one point, they, they remember they were marching people in, and they told me this is from the camp. You know, I was told that when I was wearing the Polish 
to a band mm -hmm. as a Polak. Mm -hmm. And they told me to on the camp, I uh, forgot the name, uh, that, well, my, that my brother in law was in. And oh yeah, told, I mentioned you. Know, so I didn't, you know, so I wanted to see, see him. But I, you know, okay, so I helped him. Mark, Mark, weiter machen, weiter machen, weiter machen, go, go, go. And I see him wearing, I had a, what's in the cover on it, this, and, but I didn't rec uh, I did not uh, uh, say, uh, Tell him who I am. Now, just out of curiosity, how did you come to pose as a Polish national? How did I, that happen? I was, uh, I, as I said, I, I was, uh, Oh, always, always uh, trying things. I got, I got the band from uh, as a Polish national, from somewhere. So I organized it. I just, uh, maybe uh, I stole it. Maybe this. I don't. This I don't remember exactly how come I wore this. But I, I had maybe I stole the whole uniform, the whole jacket. With this band on from down years, you know, because I was always trying, uh, trying to get a little more food, a little more this, a little, uh, you know, more, or, more leverage, more leverage all the time, and uh, yeah, ever, ever, you know, was in all the things, in all the camps, this camp. And one camp in Markstadt, and this was a, a young man that was, his father was a mashgiach in a butcher store. So they came, to, so they asked when they came in, comes in this, who's a butcher here? He said he's a butcher because his father was a mashgiach. So he worked for the assess. In the Seth's kitchen, he was cutting meat there, but it was this. So he used to bring, in the Seth's kitchen was outside of the camp, not in the camp. So he used to bring me in food. And all the time, a little food. This is a big, you know, this was a big, big help. And so at one point, he brought in. There's a, about a 10 pound, about 10 pound um, can, a uh, uh, barrel with jelly. He brought me in a half of this thing, and I ate it up. Because why? He couldn't save it, because otherwise somebody else will grab it for you and eat it. You know, uh, so it was long, it was to go along when I came from Buchenwald. And it was in the washroom, and, they, and, they, and I snuck myself in with these Hungarian boys. And I got, in, and I got into this barrack of 49. And this was over there. There was the guy, a man. Demra, Demra was a Lagerführer, Jewish guy, and a, and a very good person in 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 Blechhammer. Blechhammer like was like Markstadt. Blechhammer was a different kind of camp, like like Markstadt, and also not far in the same area. He was, and he had a little boy with him. He had a little boy and things survived. And, you know, and, 
So I was in this barrack 49. You know, because of the, the told you, he does, he, the, the cop in the, in the washroom told me, no, now put yourself in with these people, you know, and so start screaming, Lenjel Jido means Polish Jew, the Hungarian boys. So, okay, so, and it was in Barrack 49, and from there, they didn't bar, I wasn't bothered so much. They didn't call my number out to go out to, go to work. One time, and they grabbed me, and they went in the, I worked in the, in the, what do you call it? But they, they, no, I said, Steinbrucher, whatever, they, they, digging, digging out rocks on the, the in, stone in the, quarry. Yeah, no, you know why? I think later on they buried the gold and those, the Germans, and this, uh, all the treasures that they stole from the Jews, they were buried there later on. That's why they put a big, big hole. Only I worked only once or twice. They didn't. So they didn't. I didn't. Not steady every day. So I must. And then you know. But I was still all the time. At one point, I saw the the. The, the, the thing the way they keep the food um, uh, 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 what you call it the storage room I look I saw through the window so what did I do I broke the window tried to get at some uh, it was margarine or something to pull out and all of a sudden I hear something motorcycle I, 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 I knew who it was coming, and I ran away. And they was, I ran into a, one of these buildings that they have that was empty cattle that they boiled the food in. I jumped into there, and the, the SS guy was looking for me. Couldn't find me. He didn't go in to look in the cattle, lucky me. Because otherwise, <laughs> he would have killed me. Uh, you know, and another point, uh, when I uh, stole the pills, and so from there, I tried to uh, kill me. Now. So, <clears throat> and then, and so, uh, somehow, I used. I was an organizer and here when my brother-in-law was walking by and I was wearing a Polish uniform. But the other boy recognized me. Maya? And then from my city, a friend of mine. Maya? See? Oh, the, the, the coppers heard this, so they pushed me in. And I got out the other way and I became back the same guy, you know. Uh, it's, uh, you know. And then later on, the approach to be heard. I mean, the, a lot of people that knew they had radios, they had, they had a radio, they had something. They had, Russian prisoners in, in Bochenwald, but they were separated. They didn't, as a matter of fact, Rav Lau. Rav Lau was, uh, was taken care by a, a Russian officer, if you know them, if you read this in Bochenwald, you know. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Huh? You know see, he was an 18 year old boy. And I, I never, I didn't, I didn't get to them. I never saw. I saw them from far because they were political prisoners of war. 
we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, nothing, we are the Jews that have to be killed. You know, they are, they, you know, because they were worried they, they, that they, 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 if they kill a, a, a Russian, they'll take a, they'll kill German soldiers that the Russian had, oh, you know, so they uh, were handled different. Yeah, and point in short, they had a crematorium in Bochumwald, where you see the, the burned people. And you see, uh, the, so as a, and then came in 1945. Mr. Mr. Glickman, uh, we're going to take a little break here, and we're going to start again in 10 minutes, give you a little break, and um, we'll begin with the Buchenwald and your time in Buchenwald in 1945. So we're going to uh, just take a pause right now.